Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're listening from, and thank you uh, for listening. My name is Joseph, and I'm your host. I'm the Resume Whisperer and Corporate Cultist. I've been trying to show you that if you do just get noticed, you'll get promoted, you'll make a difference, okay? And today, I'm very excited to have another wonderful guest that's going to talk about their experiences as uh, starting off as a nurse then kind of progressing into kind of management and leadership and uh, implementing multiple initiatives. Uh, she's also a professional author on the horizon of spiritual enlightenment. So she's going to talk about how uh, she is now connected the spiritual with the medical and trying to help other people make their lives better. And again, the idea is that you understand and take for yourself whatever points that can help you move forward in life. So let's uh, welcome Lydia Fugeres to the show. Thank you, Lydia, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. So uh, you started off as a nurse. So let's start with what inspired you to become a nurse uh, as a kind of a starting uh, point. I wanted to be a nurse from very young. Actually, I had an aunt that lived in the basement in a house uh, who was a nurse. And uh, I saw her, her do an intervention. And um, I decided that I wanted to be like her, actually. I really wanted to be like her. And uh, I adored her. She was so very kind. Uh, and Louise, she was very kind. And also, my father was uh, part of the St. John Ambulance team. He was teaching. So that is how I came to become a nurse. That is pretty much uh, why I decided to be a nurse and uh, not a doctor, actually. I really wanted to be with the public. I wanted to interact with the public. I did not want just to walk in a room and go out. I really wanted to interact with the public and uh, have time to talk to them because uh, doctors are extremely busy and I understand their life and they cannot actually do what they want. They have to hurry up all the time. So we nurses, we have more time on our hand to talk and interact with our patients. So you bring something I think that's very important, which I think uh, in today's world is lacking, which is those communication skills, the, the empathy, the, the patience to talk to us. So uh, what would you say uh, to become a great nurse in regardless of which department you work in are the main skills that, you know, in terms of communication and empathy uh, you would need? Uh, obviously your training as a nurse is very important, but uh, that, making a difference, making an impact, really connecting with your patients. What are some of the things that you've done to do that, please? You have to be a perfectionist to start with because there is no place for mistakes as a nurse. You cannot make a mistake, that's for sure. But also you have to be able to listen. You really have to be able to listen because people that are in a hospital or any environment that requires a nurse, they suffer. 
So it is not time to judge. It is time to listen. It is not time to analyze. Actually, it really it, the only thing that you are supposed to do is listen and with an open mind. Very important to have an open mind. Whatever you're thinking is, is out the window. You really have to have a very open mind. And uh, the thing is that you have to use your knowledge and your environment to help them also. Because, and you have to be loving, I admit, because um, some people are difficult. And, but when someone is very ill or stressed, they can be difficult and we have to understand that they have they can be difficult so it is not time to criticize absolutely not so it is time to actually listen and be there for them be in the present moment that is all no that criticizing is, no thinking that is beautiful and if only that mindset was a, would apply to so many other professionals that you know lose their patience very quickly uh, you know, I've been guilty of that too myself, but you know, we are all human where sometimes we're just so frustrated and we're not getting anywhere. But I, I, I've tried to build my career on being empathetic and patient with people and really kind of try to step into their shoes, even as a leader where it's not, you know, dictator style, I told you to do this, go do it, but more of collaborative, here's why we will all benefit from that. So uh, you became a nurse very successful uh, beyond getting additional education and certification. What are some of the things you did to stand out to be given opportunities in leadership and grow within a hospital and medical environment? Well, to start with, I was very opinionated, which was very different from uh, those that actually did not give their opinion at all. Um, I did give my opinion. I was not always fine with the decisions. So I discussed the decisions because some were not good and I would actually discuss them. I was not afraid to discuss a decision that was not for the best of my patients. So I was not afraid to come forward and say, this is not good for my patient. No way, this is not good. So when you are not afraid of protecting the rights of your patients, this is absolutely sure that they see a leader in you. My father was a leader. My father had a business, but he also was, uh, uh, he was, he was also a, a leader in his world. He was in a mine. So I was raised in a leader environment. So I did not let anyone step on my feet. And uh, the rights of the patients were very important to me. So that is why they have decided that I should be assistant head nurse in no time. Because they knew I could stand on my two feet and actually go for the rights of the patients. Say you've heard it, you know, sometimes you need to be assertive and stand your ground, uh, stand on your values. Um, so you became head nurse and then you advanced even more than that. Uh, you started having teams underneath you. So what did you do to show appreciation of your nurses to kind of build a culture of teamwork, if you don't mind sharing some initiatives and some of the things that you did? Well, with the nurses, it, well, first of all, it's easy to work with nurses. Um, we actually get along very much. It's, it's, it's an environment where women actually get along with other women because we all want the same thing, the benefit of our patients. So we are, we are zen, we are calm with one another, we are understanding with one another, and we will do anything to help one another. So if a nurse had a problem whatsoever, I would do anything to help her, absolutely anything. Uh, I would go out of my way to help her or him 
because <laughs> male nurses also. So I would do anything to help the nurses. I also was listening to them a lot because they have family issues, they have problems. Um, people do not think about suicides amongst the medical staff, but we have to look out for that. We have to make sure that our staff is not in danger we we really have to make sure that our staff is not in danger so that is why i even went and moved on to working in part-time in psychiatry also to help myself to actually help myself understand what we're going on with others it was very very important for me and uh, the staff appreciated me because um i did not think i was above I treated everyone like we we should all be equal on earth. So um, whether it was uh, the cleaning lady or myself or an assistant, uh, an assistant, we're all the same. So we're there for the same thing. For the I think well -being you, I think you just everyone. said something that's very very important: is that regardless of your title and the level of what you do, uh, you still matter. And acknowledging someone who's cleaning the floor or you know a c-level executive in the same way uh, is very very important because it creates that level of um, appreciation understanding that you know we all have a place to roll because obviously if a hospital is not clean nurses and doctors cannot do their job properly because that cleanliness is part of the service so um Beyond listening, and again, a lot of my guests have talked about the importance of taking the time to actually have authentic, real conversations with people, not just lip service. You know, would you do or did you do anything that was fun, that was kind of team building activities, like, you know, let's go have some fun outside of the work environment or organize an event or an activity? And can you share a little bit of thoughts and insights uh, with that, please? Oh, yes. Um, I'm just going to share that little thing. Uh, my brother-in-law is a chef. He was a chef for a very important restaurant. He was uh, he was well known. And uh, I told my team that we were having a Christmas dinner and uh, that I had invent uh, invited the chef or a so-so restaurant to cook for us. They were really, really impressed uh, because he was there and he was cooking, he was do doing everything. We were having this really wonderful banquet. And then at the end of the meal, he was serving just like he did not know me. And at the end of the meal, he hugged me and he gave me a kiss on each cheek. And no one understood what was going on because the chef was the chef. And finally, we had fun because um, I told them he was my brother-in-law. We, we really had fun. And uh, sometimes we would go in restaurants. Um, we go and dance also. Um, yes, as a team, we would do things. Uh, some would go golfing also. I do not golf, but some would go, go golfing. We hang out as friends. We hang out, actually. Uh, we have breakfast also. Let's say you're on the night shift. Uh, you finish at 8, eight o'clock in the morning, you hang out, you go have breakfast together as a team. Well, you know what? Uh, I've always said food is a great way to connect with people. And uh, obviously having a chef is definitely a great experience that I'm sure your team enjoyed. So I want to kind of take this. You've progressed in the medical field very nicely, you've had leadership position. And then where or how did your spiritual journey start? Uh, that led you to your book. Um, and if you want to share what your book is about or what you teach people and uh, how that connects to your experience from the medical field. Well, the spiritual journey started very young, very, very young. But the thing is that I actually contracted a parasite um, at the age of 41 years old, uh, which led me to be bedridden for two years and in a wheelchair also. Um, I was extremely sick. I was told I would die 
but I had made the decision that actually I would see my daughter graduate. She was only eight years old. And I had decided that I'd stay a while to see my daughter graduate. I was not ready to die. And um, it's not that I'm against death, but <laughs> I had something to do. So um, I decided to embark on a journey where <coughs> resilience was just part of my life, that no matter what, I was going to pull through this. I was actually going to pull through it. So I was meditating. People would come and see me and they were crying. What were they <coughs> crying about? I was the one that was supposed to be in trouble. I was a happy camper. I was a happy person. I was so very happy and people did not understand even without moving and with such pain how you can actually be calm inside so very calm inside and be so resilient and be in touch with the universe so i would listen to people that were visiting me and i was the one that was <coughs> ill but that was fine for me i actually it was a great journey because um i have to admit that i do not regret any of it absolutely not because if it were not for that journey i would not know what i know so while i was ill bedridden in, incapable of moving I had these thoughts that were coming to me because I, I did not speak ever. I would never speak because I was in too much pain. And I would just think and I would have these reflections about life and about people and, and about all kinds of things that were happening. I never watched TV. I did not even know what was going on. So I was completely out of touch with the world which gave me the opportunity actually to be one-on-one -on -one with call it the source the divine power whatever some people believe in uh, a rock uh, the universe uh, I, I do not know what but the thing is i was communicating with that form of energy which was actually giving me such peace, such inner peace. I was in meditation pretty much all the time, but I had started meditating very, very young. My father started me very young. Well, first of all, what a powerful story and uh, congratulations on overcoming your health issues and look where you are now. Um, kudos. And again, I think to me, uh, as someone that, you know, also now later on in life, I'm starting to blend the, you know, Western medicine with non-traditional medicine, because I found that sometimes Western medicine just goes take drugs and they don't necessarily look at the source, but it's more of a bandage. But there's other times where, like, for example, doing acupuncture and cupping has worked better for me than taking the medication that the doctors prescribed for me. And so, you know, there's a level of always learning more about. It. So you, you went through this ordeal and you wrote an, an amazing, incredible book. Tell us a little bit about what's in the book and what people can expect uh, when connecting with you and talking to you and working with you um, and a little bit about your programs. Well, actually, the book, uh, those two books, there's a third one going out very soon. Those books are um, reflections on all kinds of thoughts or observations that I had about life in general, um, of what happened either to me, to others, and they will help people grow spiritually. 
actually they will help them find their why am I here, what's my purpose, uh, whatever, and they will find that their journey is for a reason. We're all on a journey for a reason. We're on a spiritual journey. We're not here to just work. We're on a spiritual journey. And it's, it's wonderful to be on a spiritual journey that is so amazing. And people should actually take adversity as a blessing. So I explain in my books that adversity is a blessing in disguise. And that if you do not have what you want, actually there's something better that's waiting for you. So it's kind of a guideline to life. And um, it, it really does help with people. Uh, they just listen to, like, um, I will give an example. Uh, this one is a very hard one. Okay. Which one? Um, I, will, I, will give it, I will give the answer. That the path to the, to the divine source, you have to go through a thousand petals. So people... People keep on asking me, what do you mean? The path to enlightenment, you have to go through a thousand petals. Well, the thing is that, you know, the lotus is considered as the thousand petal flower. And spiritually, when you actually are in the crown chakra, because I work with chakras, when you are in the crown chakra, that is the, the flower representing the divine source. So you have to go through the crown chakra to reach the divine source. So by opening your crown chakra, which is opening the petals, you actually are being a person that can find enlightenment. And everyone can find enlightenment because the thing is that we are all masters in, in becoming. We are all here for the same thing. Absolutely. I love the a thousand petals uh, analogy. I never heard of that. So that was kind of something new for me. But I also want to touch into something that I think is very important. And I want to connect the dots here in a few layers. You mentioned that having adversity is important in life to help you get out of being stuck in whatever it is that you're stuck and moving forward. And I could not agree more with you because I think what makes me an expert in resume writing, in kind of recruiting, is I've switched careers nine times. I've switched jobs 18 times or so. And so I had to go through it to master it. Um, and I think that, you know, this is something that right now I'm, I'm finding as a pattern that some of the younger generation, the millennials have this mindset of you owe me. And there's an expectation of just give it to me. And I don't think that, you know, just handing it over is doing justice because like if if you have unlimited money that was just given to you you'll never have a reason to have a purpose you'll never have a reason to kind of define uh or say i earned this or i made a difference now i'm not saying you shouldn't have a little bit of help and uh growing but i i, I firmly believe that you know the experiences where adversity kicks in and the creative genius comes out because survival kicks in and what do I have to do and how do I have to do it to get there? Uh, you know, when, when we're in a routine, uh, a lot of people dismiss that. So I want to tie that in because as a nurse, you know, you're dealing with a lot of different adversity all the time. So does the profession or did you as a leader provide training uh, in terms of experiences or kind of conversations about experiences so that your team is a lot more prepared to deal with, you know, extreme situations and make sure not only that they follow the protocols and the procedures, but come up with great solutions. 
Well, actually, when you work in ICU, emergency, those uh, departments, you actually have to have a plan B all the time. Uh, absolutely, you really have to have a plan B because things don't always work the way they're supposed to work. And uh, you are in situations that are really, really absolutely serious. You yourself, sometimes you're overwhelmed by what is going on, but you have to wake up. You have to say, you know, I'm the one in charge, so I, I cannot panic. I have to stay calm. But um, the way actually I was dealing uh, with my team actually was through humor, which is strange when things are really, really serious. Um, I had to bring in some humor in the entire situation because the thing is that, you know, it was like so serious that, you know, some were having like a heartbeat uh, 140. So you have to bring the tension down. You really have to bring the tension down. So you try to do something that will ease the tension. You actually really have to create an atmosphere that is a lot calmer in, in dramatic situations, because I'm talking about really, really dramatic situations. There are situations that you, you want to run away from, but you can't. So you have to deal with it. So the thing is that, you know, if, if you can actually help your team cope with the situation with all kind of mechanisms, like, yes, humor is good, but also you can also uh, sh show an object, anything that will divert the attention from, from the person. And that mechanism will just like ease the tension for two and a half minutes, but that's enough. That's enough for that person to calm down and go back to what they were doing, but they need it. Look, I think what you just said is brilliant. Like humor, uh, I try to incorporate humor a lot, uh, but it's interesting that you talked about the object as kind of changing the energy. Uh, there's a world famous uh, fish market in Seattle where they throw the fish to each other and they interact with the customers and the late customers taste and uh, they hold the fish and kind of wiggle it to there. And you can see like people that are super grumpy and then all of a sudden they see the fish and they're smiling and they're playful. Um, and it's actually used as motivation and a tool in the corporate world to get people to understand teamwork dynamics right now. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, uh, you know, I've spoken to several people in the medical profession and sometimes say, you know, unfortunately you have some hospitals where politics are very strong and there is a potentially toxic culture or work environment. Uh, as someone that wasn't afraid to be assertive and as someone that was not afraid to step up, what would you do or what have you done to turn around a toxic, you know, conflict resolution or conflict filled work environment and create a dynamic where people understand we're here to work together. We're here to serve. We're here to, to make a difference and uh, slowly but surely build an inc inclusive team environment. Well, what I was doing is that what I was doing actually is that I would tell my staff, everyone that were working with me, because I was a nurse, I was an assistant, assistant uh, chief nurse. It was depending on the day. So if I was a regular nurse, I, I was following the orders. That is only the only thing. But the thing is that with a team, actually. You have to you have to let them grow with you. You really have to let them grow with you. You have to develop team spirit. Um, and you have to avoid gossip. Absolutely avoid gossip. Loss of time. There is no general hospital environment that can be tolerated because if there's a general hospital environment that is 
that is that that they, they if they do like general hospital you'll never get a team real team work so if there is if 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 there is gossip you just stop it that is all you just like just say too many details we do not know need to know that is it helping our work that is all no gossip uh, wow, like very, very powerful, Lydia. I mean, I agree with you that gossip is like cancer. It spreads and it hurts uh, the dynamic and so forth. Love your insights on how to address it and come together. Uh, do you have any workshops or any seminars coming up where you talk about the spiritual connection, the you know your own health awareness uh, that people that might be interested in connecting with you can know about i am building a program right now it's going to be soon uh, available with robert j moore um the author robert moore i am building a program with him and uh he's my coach i really like him he's a very good coach by the way and uh, i am building a program with him because the thing is that those books they're guidelines. They're not only reflections, they are guidelines. So we will, we are building a program that actually is based on topics. So I will give courses on different topics depending on the spiritual spiritual level of a person. So those that actually are on different levels of, of enlightenment actually will be able to go and participate in those programs. There is also that I will be doing guided imageries. I've been doing guided imagery from the age of 24. So guided imagery is like miracle. You have no idea. I worked in neurosurgery and some people that were totally paralyzed walked after months of guided imagery. And I, actually help people that were in the coma with guided imagery to get out of the coma wow. and they, they can hear so it's so very important so guided imagery program spirituality all kinds of things like that so we are working robert moore and myself we are working uh, to establish an important program that will help everyone elevate themselves spiritually uh brilliant i love that um so we've put your website so that people can kind of see who you are and kind of get a hold of you uh you know it's interesting that you talk about guided imagery um you know as someone and robert moore is one of my mentors as well he is phenomenal he he's also a show on usa global tv and radio uh, his show was on yesterday uh, but, you know, because I've read and I've surrounded myself with people that are very, very smart and have achieved a lot in their life, I have two beautiful little kids. I have a four-year-old daughter and almost two-year-old son. And every morning and every night, every morning when they wake up, as soon as they wake up and every night when we put them to bed, uh, we have a mantra that we say to them, right? And the mantra I've purposely kind of picked the words in a sequence i start by saying you're you're beautiful and attractive you're smart and intelligent you know uh you're very able and you will have an abundance of health and wealth in your life uh you're very creative and you're going to change the world for the better you're awesome and everyone loves you you know you're strong and brave and fearless, you're healthy. Um, and mommy and daddy love you very, very much. And we're always gonna believe in you. And we're always gonna trust you. And we'll support you no matter what. And we love you, love you, love you. And never, never stop being curious. And, you know, compared to other kids in the age range, like 
my kids will climb up the walls and up this and they have no fear and they will explore and they'll be creative and uh, you know they'll be very social and they'll come and you know talk to new kids and try to play with them in the playground and i believe it's so important to plant those seeds early on and build that imagery of confidence build that imagery of success build that imagery of you know here's what it is and clearly you've done that in the medical profession and the nurse you said getting people out of comas wow what a powerful an amazing story. We have a few minutes left, Lydia. Any final thoughts, anything that you want to share in terms of, you know, your journey, helping others, uh, you know, how people can connect with you uh, as, as a final thought for everything? Well, I do invite people to write to me uh, from my website or uh, my Instagram or my Facebook page. I do invite people to write to me. It might take a little while but i answer absolutely everyone without exception um i do not write long emails naturally but i do answer everyone and what i really would love to hear from the readers is what is it that they have learned from the journey with the 111 reflection for thy earth odyssey one and two what they have learned from it and to tell me if actually reading it once and then reading it after a month again because those are reflections that are quite easy to read but the thing is that after a month you already have changed so you can start the reflections again because something else has happened in your life so you learn something else you you had evolution again in your life spiritually and you know mentally everything so whatever happened i'm very interested in my readers in knowing what they are going through i am very very interested so it's important to me that i follow my readers not only that my readers follow me it is important for me to follow my readers because they matter to me as much as i matter to them and as much as everyone matters on this planet so we're all here for the same journey so why not enjoy the ride that is all that's the way i see it brilliant i love it and you know i love that you ended with it's a reciprocal relationship and it's an ongoing relationship and if you want to succeed in life you got to keep reinvesting in yourself in whether it's reading whether it's spirituality uh or uh, sorry or um just self-development, professional development, whatever it is. But the idea is that when you build relationships, there we go. Uh, Lydia is holding up her book so that our viewers can see them. Thank you, Lydia. And um, so, you know, take the time. And if you're starting your career, find mentors like Lydia that can guide you and help you, whether it's as a, in the medical nursing profession or on a spiritual journey, or overcoming adversity. At the end of the day, they all will overlap. And this is what will help you succeed, not only in your career, but in life as a whole. My name is Joseph Stetter. I am the Resume Whisperer and Corporate Culturist. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please like and subscribe if you do. And thank you for listening. Have yourself a beautiful night, a great morning, and an exciting afternoon. Thank you.